Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Presumption. I'm joined by Jim Griffin. Hi, Jim. Hey, Sarah. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. And um, this very handsome guy here with us, Will Folks. Welcome, Will. Hey, thanks. For, I figured you guys needed somebody on the show with less hair than Jim. So here I am. <laughs> Happy to help. <laughs> Um, so we're going to be talking about today about, um, Will basically told me, you know, Jim was asking me, is Will okay to talk about this and that? And Will told me he'll talk about anything. So, uh, uh you know, I'm taking you up for that. Um, I am very interested in you sharing with us your journey in sobriety, because obviously that's a big part of our mission here on this podcast. Um, and then a little something, something you had to do with Nikki Haley. We're going to talk about that. Um, your coverage of Murdoch, of course, um, and, and how that came about. And then uh, corruption in South Carolina. I've seen you in your feed talk a lot about, you know, um, you know you're on this mission of, against corruption down there. And then two cases. Uh, horny Susan Smith. Um, we'll talk about that. I'm fascinated by that case. And then the, the parents, the crumbly parents who for the first time in America are um, guilty of involuntary manslaughter for the actions of their son. Um, but for those people, our viewers and listeners who don't know Will, you must know Will. Um, and I always love when our Southern constituency sits down with us. Um, he is the irreverent founding editor of Fitz News, which is an independent, unapologetic media outlet covering news and politics in South Carolina. I've also since seen sports and all kinds of news that you cover. And prior to establishing Fitz News, he was the press secretary to the governor of South Carolina, played bass guitar, led a very colorful life, which we'll get to. And he lives with his wife and many, many children in the Midlands area of South Carolina. You've got eight kids, bro. Oh, almost. Almost. Eight. Almost eight. Seven at the moment. But yes, number eight is yeah. is on route. So we're, we're very like close. Very excited. Issue? What's that? Is that a pro-life issue or what? <laughs> I go where I'm told, literally. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just looked around one day. We were at five and she said, I'm pregnant again. And it's like, OK, well, at that point, you know, just keep going. <laughs> just roll with it, you know. Well. Yeah, Jim's got four. I've got zero. So anyway, um, and you mentioned off the record, well, that you that Fitz News was created by accident. Tell us about that. Yeah, that is actually true. And a lot of people seem to think there's a grand design by uh, everything that Fitz News does. And I think that this story is kind of emblematic of the evolution of the website. But yes, it was back in the, uh, you know, mid aughts, I guess you would say, when mm -hmm. blogs were just starting up, political blogs in particular were starting up. And I was on one of them. And uh, this was back when I really still cared what people said or thought about me. And so I was furiously typing a response to some comment and I hit literally hit the wrong button. And so instead of posting my comment, it took me to some page that, that said, create your own blog in three simple steps. And I'm very tech illiterate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in fact, everybody that works for me will tell you how tech illiterate I am. But I thought, you know what, I could probably do that. And so I clicked the three buttons, started a blog. And here we are a decade and a half later, one of the biggest media outlets uh, in the Palmetto State. So it's been a crazy ride. I know that, you know, Jim and Dick um, uh, have a lot of respect for Fitz News and, you know, sort of your transparency and your ethics and your journalism. Um, for me, I was not I, I'm going to admit, I didn't know what, I didn't know Fitz News um, until after, almost close to the time the trial ended, the Murdoch trial ended. Um, during the trial, I was following Avery, who was reporting for Post and Courier. And, you know, you just kind of get fixated on this, like, one one person's feed. He's um, great. Yeah. He's a great reporter. And then after, of course, um, you know, I, I, I know that uh, obviously Jim and Dick were... Um, have a lot of regard for you and I started following you and I've seen you. Um, it's been very difficult at times for you not to fight back, but you restraint your tongue and pen, <laughs> as they say in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> some days, some days, most days. 
Yeah, and uh, and and I and I do love your story. So I'm going to turn it over to Jim because he's down there. Obviously, Murdoch was his case, and um, and he knows all about corruption in South Carolina. So I'm going to let him take it from here. Yeah, just um, just back to Fitz News first, though. Will what what does Fitz stand for? Mm. FITS. Well, it's funny. I, I'm glad you asked that. There's actually uh, one of the one of the lawsuits that got filed against us recently alleges that it stands for first in the South and that that is somehow indicative of a uh, rush to publish information. Uh, actually, uh, first in the South, that's a reference to the presidential uh, calendar. Fitz News started as a political website, but that's actually not what the website stands for. So if you go to, um, I think it's actually on Wikipedia, but uh, it actually, I uh, got my card here. You can see it fits. It actually yeah. stands for Faith in the Sound, uh, which is a lyric from a 1990 uh, George Michael song. It was the one where all the, the models were lip syncing. Yeah. And so that is actually what it stands for. But there's like literally no one knows that. So it's it's kind of fun to, to see people guess at what it stands for. So, uh, but there you go. Now you guys got the truth. It's nothing to do with fitness, right? <laughs> well, clear, clearly not. Although I was in pretty good shape when the Murdoch trial started. And then afterward, after six weeks of eating the food in Walterboro, not so much. Yeah. But um, <laughs> Yeah, you would be surprised how many people tell me that I look so much better in person than I do on TV. And frankly, it's because, you know, I ate and drank and worked my ass off during six weeks. And so, you know, we're all we all got run down during that during that trial. And, and you guys, you know put in as much time or almost as much time as we did, I, I'm sure. But just, just back still on Fitz News, you know, I followed you for, I can't, you know, since you started, frankly, but I mean, you, it, it, it the platform has evolved um, clearly from the early days when it was more of a gossip column and you, you, you would post the hottest female lawyers in the state. And I mean, it, and then now you're, I mean, you're not mainstream media, but, but you're, your journalism is is very high quality and it's it's news now for sure. Yeah, it's definitely evolved. Um, you know, I think your characterizations are, are accurate. You know, it was not what I would refer to as a media outlet for a long time because that wasn't what I was trying to do for a long time. Um, I think the the moment we really started trying to shift it was uh, about 2017, which is when we started moving to a subscription-based model. And I think my thought process at that time was that if if, if we're going to have subscribers, if we're going to run it like that, then we need to start taking it a little more seriously. So, um, yeah, I think the tone of the site these days is uh, definitely more in line with a more traditional mainstream outlet. However, I do like the fact that um, from time to time we will, uh, you know, be a little more aggressive, I think, than some of the mainstream outlets. And I like that because it lets all of the judges, all of the prosecutors, all the lawmakers in particular, it lets them know, hey, these guys are still a little crazy. They're still, you know, you never know exactly uh, you know, what they'll say. And I, I guess, Jim, you, you know, I mean, we weren't exactly kind to you and Dick uh, all the time. So, uh, yeah. No, you know, mean no like, you mean like that, you that, that, one of the things that, that you did, and, and I, I got to tell you, you got great sources. I mean, you, you do have, you know, you high quality sources, you get good information, not always accurate, but you know, somewhere in, in the ballpark, I mean, the information and, and you did report like two days after the Murdoch murders that Alec Murdoch was a person of interest. And I think you subsequently said that you even had stronger information, but that you, you know, you felt restrained not to say he was a suspect, but a person of interest. And, and I got to tell you, when I read that, you know, smoke came out of my ears and I talked to Scott about it and they were like, they were very upset about it, but you know, I don't want to know who your sources are, but, but you are usually first in, in breaking news. I will say that. Yeah, try to try to get it right. Don't always do it right. Don't always get it right, but that's the goal. That's what we're trying to do for sure. Let, let me, let me, let, let's talk about Nikki Haley right quick. And <laughs> Um, By the way, wait, hold on a second. Hold on. Before you get to Nikki, who are the who are the hottest lawyers in 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 South Carolina? I want to know. Well, we clearly met. I mean, women or men too? No, there Jim. were guys on there. There were guys on there, but we clearly met. I mean, I don't know if you know this, Jim, but I had um there. It was something I tweeted the other day, and um your part law partner um Maggie I think retweeted it um. And oh, yeah. I didn't think it was her. And I was telling all these other people, oh, that's not really her. That's not her. She would never. 
And then somebody, one of, one of her buds was like, oh yeah, that was her. And I was like, oh, I'm not worthy. <laughs> so we, she well, would absolutely. Maggie's a big fan of yours, Maggie. Like has wow. sent me a lot of your, she might not visibly show it, but she <laughs> DMs me a lot of your posts. So I know she, she's a fan of yours. Well, and a, and a great lawyer too. And the, you know, there's so many like just killer female lawyers in South Carolina. And, and also, you know, you got to uh, give it up for justice, former justice Jean Toll. I, I haven't always been uh, complimentary of her. Uh, I didn't necessarily agree with her rulings on the Murdoch case, but boy, did she show um, command of that courtroom and, a, and an adeptness with the arguments and the case law. <laughs> I, I appreciate you segueing into Justice Toll, but we're talking about hot lawyers. Well, and I'm just trying to get Jim away from Nikki Haley. So that's that's my master plan here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm on Nikki Haley too. Trust me. I want to know as much as Jim does, but I also want to know who the hot lawyers are. Anyway, uh, go ahead. Talk about Nikki yeah, Haley. Yeah, so, so um, you know, I got the list of topics from Sarah and said, yeah, asking me about Nikki Haley. And I go, you sure he wants to talk about Nikki Haley? And I did a little Google searching and, um, and, you know, I'd forgotten Will, but you know, you, you became, you came public in 2010. You, you, you submit, you submitted the affidavit. You described that you had a um, inappropriate physical relationship with Nikki Haley at the time. She was just in the house of representatives in the state of South Carolina running for governor. And, um, and, you know, I, I don't really care about your personal relationship with anybody, frankly. And I, but you know, the, really the question, you know, I, I want to ask you is why did you come out in publicly about that? I think she was married at the time. And so I guess that's what you're referring to as inappropriate. But another lobbyist came out at about the same time. And, and um, I mean, just why? Why did you do that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of theories about it. And in fact, the the most popular theory was that it was in coordination with her campaign because it actually ended up really helping her campaign. It, it um, sure did. It sure did. <laughs> right. Um, you know, again, hindsight's twenty twenty. I would love to go back and not do that, not handle it the way that I did. Um, I was actually very happily surprised with the way that everything played out on this issue during her presidential bid, because that could have gotten pretty crazy. And, I think other than a couple pieces in the Daily Mail, um, which actually kind of exonerated what uh, what I said years ago. Other than that, I think I pretty much dodged the bullet of this whole issue during her presidential race. But, you know, my thought on it was at the time all this was going down, Nikki Haley was a limited government Tea Party candidate. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I came forward with the specific language I did at the time was that two different media outlets were getting ready to break this story. There was the Free Times, a, a local paper here in Columbia. I think that's owned by the Post and Courier now. But right. the real phone call that scared me was a guy named Jim Davenport. For those of you who aren't familiar with Jim, uh, he, he died uh, a little over a decade ago. He was an Associated Press reporter. He was the most powerful reporter in South Carolina. I don't think anyone before or since, at least that I know of, has ever had the kind of influence he had. And when he called, and indicated that this was something he was investigating, uh, I did feel like it was time to be proactive and kind of control the story. That's what us mm -hmm. in the spin business are, are taught. Um, mm -hmm. And so I actually did. Her campaign was very aware of what I was going to say, of when I was going to say it. I didn't get any indication that they were upset by it. I felt like it opened the door for them to approach it in any, any number of different ways. And I think it, like you said, Jim, it ultimately did benefit her. But when was the relationship and how long was the relationship? Yeah, the re relationship started in February of 2007 and it didn't last that long. It was over by May of 2007. Oh, okay. if I'm if I'm honest, she was a little clingy. Can I I'll just be honest. She was a little bit of a clinger um, and I was starting to date <laughs> my wife at the time. Yeah, I would, let's just we'll call stuff like it. Right. I love it. That's why I, mean, I love it. I'm not saying she was stage five or anything, but she was a little clingy and I'd started um, connecting with the woman I eventually married. <laughs> and, and who you've had seven kids and one more on the way, right? So That's right. But the real story, the funny thing is the story that never was told was, you know, my wife had had an interaction with Nikki Haley that was pretty combative. Um, I think this was in 2009, but it was one that probably would have, 
drawn a lot of attention. And I actually asked my wife at the time, I'm like, Hey, you know, if you were to share that story, that would probably, you know, have an impact on this. And she's like, yeah, right. This is your mess. You're dealing with it. So, <laughs> but yeah, they, um, well, what you're describing as clingy Nikki is something that it's a dynamic that, you know, like Jim and I also encounter in our, in our practices. It's the, it's the, maybe me more than Jim, cause I do a lot of, uh, you know, sexual assault cases, but, uh, you know, so it's the woman who thinks of a situation almost delusionally more than what it is <laughs> with expectations and then it doesn't go their way, except Nikki Haley didn't come after you for some weird, but, uh, some weird so well, dur during that though, she came out categorically denied any relationship whatsoever. Physical she did. With you. And then you release, you know, phone records and, and, you know, I remember, you know, I lived through it and, and everyone was saying, well, if it's not true, she's got the best defamation case in the world. You know, she's going to sue you. And you've been sued a lot for defamation, but she never sued you, did she? Never did. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and I, I want to get your take on uh, former President Trump's running for president again. Looks like he he is the now the Republican nominee. But but he did a speech, I believe, in Myrtle Beach where he was saying, you know, where's Michael Haley? Where's where's Nikki Haley's husband? And and we all knew what he was talking about. And then, I mean, what do you think of that? You know, I, I think sometimes he gets um, lost in his sense of his own humor. I think he thinks he's funnier than he is a lot of times. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, if I were advising him, I would not have advised him to make that remark, particularly considering that whatever you want to say about Nikki Haley at the time he made that remark, her husband was uh, serving uh, in the Horn of Africa, which, by the way, is a pretty dangerous place right now. Um, so I don't know if that's something I would have said if I were him. But, you know, this guy, he's at the point with the GOP electorate. I think he could say pretty much anything. So. But did, but did you think he was insinuating that, you know, they put Michael Haley on ice so that they wouldn't have to address these issues that, you know, we're talking about today? I, you know, it certainly was convenient for her that she did not have to have that part of the story front and center. Let's put it that right. way. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, whenever her husband comes up, he is, you know, active duty for which he volunteered for, as I understand. But anyway, True. And I, but one other thing I do want to point out, Jim, I mean, this guy, I don't want to make this guy out like he's some kind of a saint, uh, Michael Haley. I mean, this is a guy who was pretty well aware of her her extracurriculars a guy who uh was no stranger to extra extracurriculars of his own uh he's also a guy who has been sort of the vehicle for a lot of the haley family corruption that we followed whether it's the there's a casino up in north carolina where he was very quietly made a partner um uh right. and then there was also there's a, a subcontractor for a defense uh company uh selling uh uh military vehicles to taiwan Obviously, Haley was calling for America to arm Taiwan. That seems to me pretty self-serving. Yeah. So I don't. I'm not saying this guy's a saint by any stretch of the imagination. Sure. And now, when you know, we'll move on. But when Nikki Haley ran for governor, I mean, she was doing the books for her mother's dress job. I mean, and, and they were not in good financial shape. And now, you know, Sarah Palin comes to town. Um, that was um, jet fuel for her campaign. You, you and others boosted a little bit by talking about how she likes to have extracurricular activities. And now she <laughs> Me and Sarah Palin. There you go. Yeah. Now, now she's a multimillionaire. And so anyway. Um, Wait, so you were press secretary to her? No, I was actually, oh. I was her political strategist for right. about a year. Um, but yeah, That's I was press secretary actually to her predecessor, Mark Sanford, another name right. when people think of South Carolina. Yeah. Um, I actually, two questions I had, um, one is about Murdoch, one is about corruption. And I don't see those two things as the same, by the way, as you know, um, uh, on Murdoch, you know, everybody would, well, I don't want to say everybody, a certain group of people were trying to take credit for breaking the story. And Jim, you know, uh, just made a really good point about how you have great sources and, um, you alerted him to him being a, a person of interest. So what, what is, the, what is this? I mean, what is this competition? What story, what part of the story and who broke it first? Yeah. And I, I'll confess, I, I was 
way too worried about that for way too long uh, to the detriment of the news product that Fitz News was putting out. Um, obviously was working with some folks at the time that viewed credit as a indispensable part of the job. I have since learned that that's the very last thing you need to worry about. Just do the job, uh, whatever credit you get, whatever credit you don't get, take it. Don't, you know, it's just not a factor anymore for me. And so, you know, one of the things that I do think I try to do anyway is credit other outlets when they clearly first broke something. Um, if it's a document that we get later, I will still say, Hey, these guys had it first. They reported it first. You know, you mentioned Avery Wilkes a moment ago. He's a guy who's done great work on the Murdoch case. Uh, Michael DeWitt yeah. down in Hampton has done great work. John Monk with the state newspaper has done great work. All of these reporters and a bunch of national ones too. I mean, there's been national reporters who have, have dived into this story and really peeled back some of the, the nuances and the layers. And so, um, you know, but yeah, there's some folks that felt like they owned it and felt like uh, anybody that reported on it was, you know, had some nefarious agenda. And again, I just, the further I've gotten away from that mindset, I think the better work we've done. And, and certainly I think the better I felt about it, because, you know, just not worrying about that stuff. That stuff is so toxic, you know, it's just right. so toxic. And isn't yeah. life so much more peaceful now that uh, <laughs> Murdoch's on the back burner? <laughs> Cheers to that, man. Woo. Um, so, so Will, I want, to, I want to ask you your opinion as to why it attracted so much attention. And, and I, I was interviewed recently. I can't say when and where it'll be out, you know, in a few months. But uh, you know, during the course of the interview, I was told that during the trial, Court TV's viewership went up 600 percent. And I, I, I know I, I don't know what your numbers are, but I, I sense that you have had a tremendous increase in in your uh, subscriber base and i know others have because of the murdoch case and what 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 why was it so um attractive to listeners and viewers in your opinion well i think it it started obviously with the the crime itself i mean you look at this crime you look at just how graphic it was um all of the details surrounding it the uncertainty surrounding it no murder weapon etc uh, the mystery associated with it. So you have a, a savage crime, no immediate explanation for it. Uh, I think that immediately gets people's attention. Then they start looking at the characters involved and, oh, wait a minute, it's this guy whose family has has run this part of the state for the last hundred years, basically. Uh, wait a minute, there are these judges potentially mixed up. There's all these other layers of corruption. Uh, I think that sort of started... Um, drawing people into it. But then what really to me did it, and I'm Jim, I don't know if you noticed this as well, but this story was already a very big story and was drawing a ton of attention. And then in September, when the, the roadside shooting incident took place involving Murdoch after the murder, several months after the murders, all of a sudden we just saw this second huge explosion of interest and attention. And all of a sudden it went from sort of being this very, uh, you know, uh, impactful case that everyone was already following to being something that everyone just became obsessed with. Yeah. Um, and that roadside mm -hmm. shooting, I think really propelled it because it was not only a story about something that had happened, it was a story that was continuing to happen. And so I think that incident really, to me anyway, that's when we noticed a lot of people really dialing into the story. And certainly when Netflix got involved uh, and some of the other uh, production companies, HBO obviously as well did a great job uh, Fox Nation, um, you know, those stories HBO did not do a great job. HBO, I mean, because you know why? And I mean, at the time I watched HBO because before the trial, because I was trying to get a sense of, um, by the way, you don't know this, but Jim does. My fascination with the story uh, was from the time the murders happened. Um, Chris Cuomo, it was an old friend of mine, and, you know, he, we would we would exchange story like crime stories. And, and he uh, brought this up to me and I said, this is wild, <laughs> you know? And he was, I think one of the first people in mainstream or cable media, at least on CNN to cover the story. And then I just started following it. But, um, but I thought HBO at the time I watched it, I knew nothing about 
you know, the show and I, I watched um, Jim's interview and everything. But then when the trial came about, I was fact checking the stuff that came out in the HBO documentary. And it was a lot of stuff was inaccurate, just simply not in, not a fact, you know. Um, well, and just, I mean, the same, you know, Netflix obviously did a, a very hyper focus on Buster Murdoch in the Stephen Smith yeah. case. And I think at this point, everyone can agree that isn't the way it went down. Although I will say this, I mean, I was the first guy to get the unredacted, uh, they call it a mate report, a multi-accident investigative team report. We were the first out to ever get that for the Stephen Smith case. And I remember going through it. This was 2017, I think, when I got it. So this was before the boat crash, before the double homicide, before the roadside shooting, all this. And I, I remembered seeing the Murdoch name in there like 40 times and thinking, who are these people? Mm -hmm. uh, and there was never enough in there for us to run something at the time. Uh, but obviously, when it all exploded and people began to sort of start peeling those layers back, mm -hmm. you know, obviously, Buster Murdoch became a focus. But yeah, I don't know. I look at some people really want to pin all that on Buster Murdoch. I, you know, I, again, that's some, that's part of the story to me where things sort of jump the shark, I guess, is the term I would use. Let me know. So during the shortly after the, the murder sled and, and, and there were, you know, there'd, there'd been a lot of discussion about all oh, their sled is putting so much effort and time and energy in solving these murders of Maggie and Paul. And what about Stephen Smith? And and then during the midst of that, you know, sled says we are opening an investigation into Stephen Smith based on information we've learned in the Murdoch investigation. I mean, to this day, I mean, do you have any idea what the hell they were talking about? I do. Actually, it was that report. It, literally, no one had ever sent them that original Highway Patrol report with all of the Murdoch references. And so, you know, when they made that announcement, like you, uh, Jim, and and probably Sarah, if you're following that too, I thought, mm -hmm. wow, they've got something from the crime scene, something right. in Alec. You know, forensic. <laughs> it, that's exactly where my, my mind went. But apparently, it was literally someone forwarded them this report, and that was all it was. And uh, I think that ended up being very unfair uh, to Buster Murdoch because it created this perception that there was a connection that was much stronger than it ultimately ended up being. Let, just sort of closing the loop on this as the Murdoch story, is it fading now? Um, is it, does it still garner as much? I can tell you, I can tell you from my perspective, Right after I couldn't go anywhere without anyone recognizing me. Then after time went on, I get to, you know, I know you from somewhere. Where did I know you from? To now they look at me like, who is that? Who guy? the hell are you? Yeah, I don't <laughs> talk to me anymore, which is, I'm glad to get back to my old life, I promise you. But, but it's what, definitely, your assessment? Well, where are we on the news cycle for Murdoch? Yeah, it, it's definitely died down since the uh, motion for a new trial was was denied. And again, I didn't necessarily believe that was the right decision. Um, I watched your arguments that day, Jim. Uh, I watched Creighton Waters arguments as well. I thought Creighton did a great job. I, I just didn't agree with his assessment of the law. Um, but yeah, in the aftermath of that hearing, I think a lot of folks felt some some finality regarding it. And certainly there's a you, you probably can think in your head what the grounds are on the appeal, but you guys obviously have a great appeal coming up, certainly mm -hmm. on the federal side, if not on the state side. And, right. you know, we've got some changes to the composition of the state Supreme court that could be impactful, but, but we'll see where it goes. But, um, you know, a lot of people are still focused on the Becky Hill side of it, but as far as the Murdoch case itself, yeah, I think people have finally, I, I never so say Jim, never, <laughs> never say never. But, you right. do not have to dye your hair. You do not have to cross dress. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you're cool. I, you know, there comes a time when you just want to cross dress, Sarah. So, you know, <laughs> don't, don't take that away from me, okay? Um, that's going on in our article, Jim. I like that. I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, I, for hey, me, hey, in high school, you know, we did have that. We we did have that beauty contest where the guys on the football team dressed up as. Oh, and I was I was Mr. Pendleton. I, I look pretty damn good in a nightgown. I got to tell you. Now, if, you, if you if you tell me that Dick Harpootlin and Jack Swirling engaged in some of this behavior at Clemson, then we got us. Now we yeah. got a story. 
Yeah, right. I, I can't. I've heard all their stories. And... You need assets. You need pictures. Um, yeah, right. So, so you know, for me, one of the things I always tell Jim is that what's incredible to me is that you know the the Murdoch story was was portrayed as this really corrupt family, this corrupt guy. He owned the legal system down there. He was embezzled. I mean, some of it was true. Yeah, he was defrauding his clients, but you know, but he just he was filthy rich and corrupt and and. I mean, I think that to a lot, to, to some extent, a great extent, it, it's it, the, the tables have turned. I mean, it, 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 the, the case now put the spotlight on a lot of other corrupt, um, you know, institutions. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm going to say this because I don't practice or live in, in uh, South Carolina. Um, sled, I mean, lying to a grand jury. Um, handling a crime scene in the way that they did, um, that's not okay. Uh, whether you want to call it corrupt or what, to me it's corrupt. And Becky Hill and then her son. I mean, so to me, it's ironic that, you know, that this whole thing was that Murdoch was, was corrupt and the Murdochs were corrupt, but then now it seems like it put the spotlight on a lot of other <laughs> people, places and things, right? Well, I think two things can be true at once. I, I think there was a lot of institutional corruption that enabled the thefts that Alec Murdoch and his associates were able to pull off. I don't think all of that has been exposed yet. I do think that particularly the feds are are digging into some of that a little, a little deeper. But you're absolutely right, Sarah. I mean, process matters. And I've always said, uh, and you know, Jim, feel free to contradict me. I, I've always said I believe Alec Murdoch did it. I believe the the verdict and the sentence were appropriate and that I believe he's where he should be. But having said that, the process, particularly in the aftermath of this trial, based on the revelations regarding Becky Hill, and I wrote this, I've wrote, written this repeatedly, uh, got a lot of heartburn about the way that went down, particularly uh, the office of Alan Wilson overseeing the investigation into Becky Hill, while at the same time relying on Becky Hill as as a counter to the testimony of some of these jurors, and and I've shared that with the the attorney general. You know, he's a friend. I think he's somebody I, I would call a friend. I think he would say the same. But um, you know, I've had some frank conversations with him about how I I feel that's a conflict, and I think they should have kicked it mm -hmm. uh, to another solicitor to handle. And uh, I'm very disappointed that the state grand jury is still actively investigating Becky Hill and these jury tampering allegations, which to me, how does that make sense? How does that in any universe lend uh, public faith to, to this process? It doesn't. And so, you know, I, I have been disappointed, but you're right, Sarah, that script did flip a good bit after the verdicts. So I have one thing on Murdoch and I want us to move forward to the, you know, cases that are in the news now. Um, you know, you, uh, You've been sober how many years now, Will? Uh, 17. 17. And um, 18 this June. Congratulations. That's a big, big deal. Um, and do you, are you actively in 12 step and stuff, or is that something from the past? No, I, I'm not. And, and the thing about sobriety, everyone's got a different way to do it. And I absolutely respect people who are in the program. And mm -hmm. I, I will say this knowing the program is there is a, a big help. Uh, I have never had to avail myself of it over these last 18 years, but knowing it's there as a resource is a big help. Also having the number of somebody you know you can call uh, in that situation. Um, if you feel like you're about to stumble, if you feel like you're you know, about to, to make a mistake, having that number that somebody you know you can call and they're going to be there for you. Those have been the things that have really helped me, but I certainly like the program has, you talked about the steps, uh, the 10th step, you know, about personal inventory and and when we're wrong, promptly admitting it, that's one that I try to try to live by um, both professionally and personally, because, um, you know, that's a huge one. And uh, certainly the first step about admitting that we're powerless um, until you do that, mm -hmm. none of the other steps are going to help you. So, uh, but yeah, it's been a journey, um, probably the smartest thing I ever did in my life other than marrying my wife. Um, and in fact, I don't think I would have been able to to, to marry my wife and, and raise the family I've been able to raise had I not uh, quit drinking and, and doing drugs first. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, it, it is, 
I, I had my own battle with one particular drug. So when you say sobriety is it's sort of like an individual thing, um, for me, it was eight years of hardcore AA. And then uh, I, did, I did not. So there are people that are simply addicts to every, like essentially uh, any substance. They say your drug of choice is just drugs. <laughs> you know, my thing right. was just one thing. For a particular reason, I had to go address a lot of, you know, issues from way back when. And so for me, I actually needed more than 12 steps, you know, and it got to a point where I actually felt disingenuous um, saying, hey, I'm Sarah and I'm an alcoholic so I don't have a problem with, with drinking. I, don't, I drink maybe once a month or not, you know. And so, um, but it is the 12 steps is something that all of us should implement in our lives, in my opinion. It, it's so basic, you know, it's just being a good person, doing better, you know, keeping your side of the street clean. Um, I, I, to me, it's not even, you know, uh, um, an addict or alcoholic uh, manual. It's everybody's manual, but that's just my opinion. And I, you know, I, I direct a lot of clients to 12 steps and for some people it works, for some people it doesn't. Um, but it, like you said, it's really good to have a support group to know where to go, to know who to talk to. Um, and on that note, I want to end with Murdoch so we can move on to the other cases. Uh, Murdoch had a pretty bad addiction to opiates. I mean, it was so obvious to me. I saw those pictures of him sweating all red, just a mess, you know, and I was like, so at the beginning when I had connected with Jim, I was like, your client is really fucked up. You know, your client, I, I can't believe people don't believe that he was an addict. Of course, at that point, well, nobody was believing anything Murdoch was saying because all, you know, the two and a half weeks of financial fraud information that came out. But um, why do you think that he, to this day, when you bring up his addiction, people go, no, he was not an addict. He was just a liar and a cheater, whatever. I mean, do you believe that he had an addiction as bad as he did? Well, I think once again, two things can be true at once. He could have had a very bad opioid addiction and then still never been able to do the amount of opioids that were linked to these financial transactions. I mean, obviously, I think, you know, Napoleon's entire cavalry, you would probably knock him down with the amount of uh, of opioids he was moving. Um, so the drug part of this has always been a big mystery because we found we went down several rabbit holes and actually came very close to making some connections that I think would have taken that angle of the story further. Um, a lot of folks were focused on the cowboys and the street yeah. part of it, but we were looking much deeper to properties, to LLCs mm -hmm. that were tied to companies that we felt were fronts for moving drugs on mm -hmm. a much bigger scale. Um, it, it, listen, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that people that are addicts or alcoholics are criminals, that they necessarily commit crimes. Now, there are plenty of people who are addicts, sober or not, who have a clean rap sheet, right? Sure. But, but, but I have seen plenty of them, including lawyers that are um, really messed up. You know, that, that I see an absolute nexus between the addiction and the financial, you know, uh, the, the moral turpitude and all of it. I mean, there is definitely I, I don't you know, I, people always fight me on this. Like, what does that have to do with this? Like you said, two things can be true. And, yeah. and, and there is absolutely a correlation between a lawyer who's really messed up on drugs and then starts getting comfortable with his client's money. Um, and to me, see, I don't I don't agree with you. I don't believe he did it. Okay. I, <laughs> I, just... I believe, well, number one, I don't believe it was proven that he did it. Number two, I don't believe he did it. I believe he knows what happened. I believe he was there. Um, and I believe that it was related to his drug use. So when you say this going down these holes, please keep going. Please. Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I do think there's something there. It bothers me. And it's like the Scott Peterson case, apples and oranges, but 20 years later, it's unbelievable the things that the defense has uncovered that is now, you know, they're trying to get um, court orders for to test, to, to bring out witness statements, et cetera. And it's just, it's just, you know, this might be one of those cases, but hopefully he'll get relief. Um, the Jim will do a great job as like he always does and, uh, and turn this around um, in the fourth circuit. So I want to talk, I want to turn this over to Jim because the Jim Crump, the James Crumbly and, his wife, Jennifer Crumbly, the two parents for the first time in America who are held uh, liable, culpable 
um, guilty on involuntary manslaughter, two different juries, few weeks apart. Um, and it is huge precedent and I keep struggling with it. So I'm going to turn it over to Jim because I want you to chime in on this. You know, I don't know what more you want me to say about it other than that, ask Will, Sarah, but the fact of the matter is, you know, the mother and the father have been convicted of involuntary manslaughter because they gave their mentally, um, you know, affected sick. sick son, you know, a gun and, you know, as a present and they took him shooting. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I have real concerns about the conviction, but I want to hear you. I know you followed it. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I have tremendous concern about the precedent and what's hard about this case is that if you look at the aggravating factors that would go into the fundamental question, would you ever convict parents for responsibility for their kids' crimes? Mm -hmm. If you look at the aggravating factors that would lead you to do that, this case really has them all. I mean, th the neglect, um, the responsibility, right. Um, in fact, the thing that really did it for me was listening to, uh, you know, some of the trial where they talked about the meeting the day of the shooting, mm -hmm. where they tell these parents that this kid needs immediate emergency assistance. Mm -hmm. um, and the and the mother's just like, are we done here? No, we're not taking it. You know, it just so the, the well, level there, of was a, there was a piece of paper. To me, that was the most compelling thing, because the mom. But, 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 the, but the school kept him in class after that. Yeah. That's, yeah. The school actually had no sense of urgency. They're like, just get him help in the next 48 hours. Like, well, we actually think it's better for him to go back to class. It's better for him to be mm. with his peers. And they kept him there. But but again, you know, the, these parents, um, the mother and fathers, the facts were a little bit different with the mother than the father. The mother was engaged in a lot of texts with the son that were cries for help that she ignored. Um the dad bought the gun. The dad didn't secure the gun. He just hid it under some clothing, apparently. But at the same time, and then there was a really bad journal that the kid had, had written his cries for help in and all that. And and the, the thing was foreseeability. The dad did not know what's in that journal. But that morning, Jim, the morning that you know the school calls the parents of the kid, he he and the mom both were aware of this horrible blueprint of the massacre saying blood everywhere and it's a shoot up. I mean, it is the blueprint and they still kept him in school. So I struggle because like you, I feel like what's next now we're going to say parents are criminally liable and voluntary manslaughter. You know, I mean, it'd be different if the parents knew the kid had a gun in his backpack. I mean, no, they, they didn't know that there was no gun missing. They were not looking for a gun. I mean, they, they called That's the, correct. To, to the school and, Saying, That's hey, correct. Parents, you've got a fucked up son. Well, there's a lot of parents out there who have that situation. <laughs> fucked up son. Well, what about and what about if the kid had killed himself? Do we then? It doesn't matter whose life was taken if the parents are criminally negligent for the actions of their kids. So, are we now going to say we're going to indict them for the kid harming himself? I mean, it's possible, yeah. right? This definitely sets the precedent. So there's several lawsuits, you know, negligent and trust cases all the time, whether it's a vehicle or I mean, I'm sure there are gun cases out there, but very seldom, I, you know, I think this is the first one where it's gone to the level of and the, it, it, criminal convictions. And they're looking at 50, 15 to 60 years in prison. Yeah. What do you think they'll get, uh, Jim? Because it's 15 per count, um, but um, they're not going to get, they're not going to get stacked. It's just four different victims. Who knows? Uh, yeah, and how much time do you have to do on that? I, it all depends on the jurisdiction. I haven't looked it up. You know how much real yeah. time you have to do, but uh, yeah, it's a frightening precedent, though. And as horrific as the facts of this case are, and as damning as they are for both of those parents, I mean, I think again, if you were looking at a case to bring charges like this, this is the case. I mean, it it's a terrible fact pattern, and uh, but still, I, I just. I have a hard time supporting a prosecutor bringing these charges. But again, as you guys know, even before this trial, there was an extended legal <laughs> process about uh, the uh, appropriateness of bringing the charges in the first place. And the courts right. in, in Michigan, I believe, erroneously ruled that these charges were appropriate to, to be brought. And um, 
But yeah, I, you know, I, I think you can bring these type charges in just about every mass shooting case involving a young adult or child. I mean, Columbine, for example, I, I think there's similar journals there. And, you know, that was, you know, it was, you know, as that's worse. Columbine was a lot worse. And then, you know, the, the, the elementary school up in, was it Maine, New Hampshire? Sandy yeah. Hook. Correct. Sandy Hook. I mean, you know, you could go after the parents, blame the parents. And, and that sort of gets me to, you know, a beef I have. You get these high profile cases and you get a jury in there and the jury is, I mean, they feel the pressure of public opinion, opinion to find them guilty in my view, but um, yeah. it's a problem. It's and a problem. on appeal, I think, Will, that the, the ruling and other rulings that you brought up will be um, grounds as well as the journal. Um, there was no evidence that the father, for example, had any knowledge about what's in the journal and yet the journal was admitted. So it was highly prejudicial and not that probative at the end of the day. Um, the other case I think we want to talk to you about, and we'll close with this, is what I call horny Susan, the case of Susan Smith from South Carolina, another notorious murderer down there. Um, and this one's very wild because Smith was convicted of murdering her two young children, three years old and 14 months old, in July of 1995. She didn't get the death penalty. In October 1994, um, she straps the two boys to their car seats in the back of her sedan and then just lets the car roll into the lake. Um, she's the last person that's seen with the boys alive. Um, she then tells the police that a black man had carjacked her at gunpoint when she was stopped at an intersection and then drove off with her children. But when they investigated the lights at the intersection, her story didn't add up. Um, so they suspect her as a person of interest and her involvement. And then this nationwide manhunt begins, um, uh, you know, for this concocted carjacker, essentially. Um, and then Smith, meanwhile, was having these pressers uh, professing her love for the boys and, you know, pleading for them to come back home safely. So 10 days after the alleged carjacking, the lie, um, Smith finally confesses to drowning the two boys. Her defense was despair. So it's not evil. It was despair. It was what was going on with me. Um, she had a very difficult childhood, but a lot of our clients do. Um, her father committed suicide when she was six. She attempted suicide herself at 13 and 17. Then her stepfather, who was a Christian leader, molested her repeatedly during her high school years, and she claimed she enjoyed it because it made her mother jealous. That's, you know, how twisted she was. And that relationship continued even after her marriage and up to just weeks before the murders. Um, closer to the time of the murders, she had an affair with a man who broke off with her. Um, you know, I think they slept together maybe a dozen times or less than a dozen times. And he moves on. And so that break breakup is what Smith claims kind of put her over the edge because this man did not want kids, including the kids that Smith had had previously, these two boys. And so um, her defense was essentially she was desperate over Finley's decision to terminate the relationship. Um, and that's what led to the murder of her children. She didn't know what was going on that night. So now she's behind bars. You've been reporting on this, Will. Um, I've been following this on your page. And she's up for parole. She didn't get the death penalty. She didn't get life with parole without the possibility of parole. She has the possibility of parole. So she's up for parole and they're, and you're taking a poll as to whether or not this woman should parole. She has had an, she got an STD while she's behind bars. She's had sex with prison staff while under their authority, like a guard and a captain. She's had sex with multiple female uh, inmates she's a sex machine and she's been having phone sex with random men and then sexting other men giggling and talking about wiggling and squirming. And it is wild. So when we think about parole, it's about rehabilitation, right? So Susan Atkins paroled, you know, in the Charles Manson case, but she was a model inmate. And so I'm looking at this woman going, she has like got to have a million write-ups for sexual misconduct. What does your poll show, Will? And what are your thoughts on this? I, I, I mean, obviously, overwhelmingly, people do not believe she should get out. And also, in addition to all those, there have been some some drug infractions behind bars for her. Some other um, infractions behind bars. She has absolutely not 
been a model inmate. And I think this case, you know, obviously the Murdoch case is a level of attention yeah. uh, on a legal proceeding that South Carolina has never seen before and will probably never see again. I mean, let's just be honest. I Being at that trial and, and the, the scrutiny and the attention, I, I don't think we'll ever see anything like that again. The closest thing to it, though, would have been the Susan Smith trial back in 1995. Uh, they called it the trial of the century back then, uh, back in the 20th century. And um, I think it was. And, you know, you did a great job, Sarah, going through all the facts of it. The thing that I that always hits me is the is the time frame. Uh, six minutes. It took that car six minutes to sink. Yeah. And according to uh, Tommy Pope, the prosecutor, he just did an interview with Jen Wood in our office on this case about some of his experiences. And he pointed out that there was not a drop of water on Susan Smith's clothes. Um, and those two things just really st stood out to me because as a dad, I, yeah, it just, you can't, you can't get inside the mind of somebody like that. My kid, you know, my kids, uh, anything, even they feel bad about something, you know, your instinct just takes over. You want to help them and save them. Or, or you at the very yeah. least go to them. And yeah. so that just blew my mind. And then so the, there was the interview with the diver um, who found the car, who talked about seeing one of the little hands through the window. It just, I mean, yeah, it's heart wrenching. And you know, this is not an, this is not a, uh, Defense. Well, you know, Sarah, they Tommy Pope sought the death penalty in that case and did not oh, get yeah. it. Yeah, Why did not? not get the death because there was no. Fault. Yeah, and that uh, Jim, it's interesting you mentioned that in his interview with Jen uh, in our office. Uh, I think we published it uh, just last month uh, from when we recorded this. Um, he talked about how he viewed it as a defeat because he got guilty verdicts, but he didn't get the death penalty. And he, he felt that she really deserved it. And I think his logic was pretty good for pursuing it because his point was, listen, let's assume that her story was true. Let's assume a black man carjacked the, the, these kids and, and killed them. Uh, would we not seek the death penalty in that situation? And of course, mm -hmm. everyone would have. So I, I think he made a very good argument for seeking the death penalty. And I also think that Tommy Pope, who's a guy I've, I've, had differences with in the past, but I, I respect the way he conducted himself in this case. And certainly he also had to do it going uphill because a lot of local law enforcement uh, were sympathetic to Susan Smith. I think her, her, uh, the, she slept well, with him or what? <laughs> no, I, I, I can tell you the, 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 he was the, 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 the law enforcement <laughs> officer who got the confession out of her is a great friend of mine. And he has, he was a retired FBI agent. He was a legend. And he sat down with her like a grandfather would, and she mm -hmm. broke down and confessed to him. And I believe he gave assurances that she, she, she that they would not seek the death penalty. And as soon as she confessed, Tommy Pope seeking the death penalty. And I know he was very upset about Tommy Pope's decision. And I'm not mm -hmm. going to name names, but so, um, so they sought. See, I didn't know this. So they sought the death penalty. They oh just yeah. Didn't get it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, she's lucky she didn't get that. She's also lucky she's not serving life without, without the parole. Now, on a, on a lighter note, there was, um, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, there was a trial uh -oh. in Richland County. Uh, some guards were being prosecuted for having sex with inmates, including Susan Smith. And the trial judge uh, relayed the testimony to me at one point in time over cocktails. And it went something like this. That, that people were testified that when the lights went out in the women's prison at night, it sounded like a soup kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. I probably shouldn't oh, have, have said wow. that. But, yeah. um, it's That's, in the court record. That is consistent with the intelligence we've gotten. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. And listen, I, I was just going to say this. It's not... Um, you know, it's not a defense, certainly. And she, I don't know who her, I don't know her defense lawyer, even if I knew the name, but um, they did the best they could to make a case that she was um, desperate and that she oh, wasn't. I, I, I believe it was David Brock represented her, and he is one of the best um, okay. um, death penalty defense lawyers in the country, he teaches at Harvard oh, now. But I just think, you know, it's incredibly sad to me 
The saddest part, of course, are the two boys and what happened to them in those six minutes. But it's also sad to me, um, the cycle of abuse. I see it in my own clients. I see it in my own cases. You know, I, I see how people get messed up and history repeats itself. It's not a defense, but it is definitely a, a horrible phenomenon. So, well, and I uh, think that's why she ultimately didn't get the death penalty, Sarah. You had mentioned it when you, when you uh, did the recap of the case, all the things that happened to her. I think that's ultimately why they decided not to give her the death penalty, because I think they looked at all of those things and thought, well, yes, it doesn't excuse what she did, but they are certainly mitigating factors on a death penalty ruling. Yeah. So I want to end with this. Um, if you get in trouble, well, you get arrested <laughs> down in, I don't know, somewhere in Columbia. <laughs> uh, would you hire Jim Griffin or Dick Harpoolian? No, Can he would hire Mary Sellers. That's his lawyer. And, you know, we don't, we don't want to take any business away from Bakari. Wait, who? Bakari Sellers is his lawyer. Oh, I, I love Bakari. Bakari is my friend. But let's say Bakari says, um, you know, Will, I, I, I'm your friend. I don't think it's right for me to do this. I don't want problems in our friendship. And you are, you just have two choices, basically. It's Dick or, or Jeff. I mean, I think, have we not established on this call, I would call Maggie Fox first. I mean, come on. <laughs> Maggie and uh, yeah, Ali Benevento. Um, <laughs> All the good know. looking women. All the good looking women. <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, that's the thing. There's a ton of great defense lawyers down here. And I think that's the one thing that I had to, you know, watching this whole case unfold, you know, say what you will about this case and what your opinions are on it. But the attorneys in this case, Jim, your work on this case, Dick's work on this case, Creighton Waters. I mean, let's give him credit. I mean, he did a, phenomenal job. Um, it was very impressive to watch uh, the counsels on both sides uh, litigate this case. Uh, just some very skilled litigators. Thanks, yeah. Lula. I mean, I, um, I'm i very impressed by the handful of lawyers that I've met in South Carolina. Um, I'm not impressed by <laughs> the rule. Well, where's Jim's bobblehead? That's what I want to know. Hey, Jim, <laughs> if you get a bobblehead, I'm, I'm in. Sign me up. You know, I've um he has to cross dress for that though. Not, cross not, dress not, quite, <laughs> not quite there yet. I um I had a bobblehead years ago from a, a personal injury lawyer who you had a case with, Akeem Anastapulo. Um yeah. so he, I think he was the first lawyer in South Carolina to come out with a bobblehead, but uh that's and then it broke after <laughs> I mean, I think it's okay to have a bobblehead that you keep in your, I don't know. No, it's not. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I take it back. I was just thinking like, maybe if you just kept it somewhere behind the scenes and didn't, you know, actually advertise it, but no, it's never okay to do a bobblehead for yourself. <laughs> I think Jim and I would have great bobbleheads. I mean, come on, look, we got a lot to work with here. I mean. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't take just an acorn is all I need, you know. That's, that's right. Acorn on the stick. Jim's holiday gift was a um <laughs> him and his girls, his daughters. Uh what are what are those? Those those are better than bobbleheads. Uh, I can't remember the name now, Jim. What are those little know. characters? I don't know. You know the little Funko, the Funko. Have you seen those, Will? No. The Funko characters that come from like Marvel series and all the different movies. Anyway, you I can think custom one of my kids make. has some of these. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. You can custom make Funkos for, you know, people. Um, I think that's way better than a, a bobblehead. Anyway, um, Will, thank you so much for yeah. giving us your valuable time today. Um, and I want to invite our um, viewers and listeners to follow Fitz News and their podcast and their on uh, X with a lot of posts and links um, and also prescribe to our podcast, The Presumption, wherever you get your podcast and also on YouTube. And um, until next time, Jim. We rest. We rest.